welcome at today's uh, sessions of our conference. And this session will be chaired by Omid today. But before Omid, before Rod will start his second part of his lecture, I would like to say something because uh, our friends from Nensky Institute of Experimental Bi Biology, they leave today, this, they leave our conference. And I have, I, I want to say something about their help. So really, we are very is organized together. I should express my, my big, sorry, Jakub Wodarczyk, because it is his group who, this conference, and also to success of this conference. Wodarczyk, uh, Dr. Eva Bonczyńska, and Dr. Anna Kaczmarek, who, Bartkowiak, who just organized this conference, essentially. It was not we, really. Slovak and I hope we will repeat this uh, conference next year or I don't know at the end of your project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, now we invite Rod Gover to continue his lecture. So Rod, uh, the internet is yours now. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Pavel. Yes, that was um, a very bad connection for my end. So I hope. Um, I hope that you can hear me better. Let me know if, if you can't somehow. Okay, good. I'm just checking the chat there to see if there's any problems. Okay, so there's two parts to today's lecture. Um, the first part um, is going to be about applications of this conformal approach that I started to develop yesterday um, to understanding the space-time boundary at infinity, the geometry of that, and the sort of links between the geometry on that boundary and the geometry of the interior manifold. Sometimes we call it the bulk. Um, and then we'll look at um, applications to actual boundary problems and scattering, which are one of the things that are of interest in relativity and, of course, elsewhere. Um, so for the first part, some references I've given here. Actually, this um, older article with Pavel um, <clears throat> is um, perhaps more background, really, for... Um, yesterday's lecture, and also to some extent this one of mine here, um, uh, rather than today's one, one. but um, I wanted to mention them because this article of Curry that is mentioned at the start of the lectures is just a sort of summary, putting to, mainly putting together these things from various places. Um, <clears throat> and then relevant to the end of this first part will be an article with um, Andrew Waldron on boundary calculus. Then the second part of the lecture is going to be about a sort of more general or a, or a general approach to geometric compactification. Um, and that's sort of linked to this article with um, Andy Chap and Matthias Hammerl. Okay, so um, perhaps before going ahead, I'll just remind you, if I can, of uh, the end of yesterday's lecture, um, where I said the moral was to replace um, your space-time manifold, if you like, with its metric, with instead a, man a manifold with a conformal structure and one of these scale tractors that is suitable. Um, and in particular, I'd explain how this is relevant for conformal compactifications. So we want to sort of apply that idea today. Um, and here's the sort of questions that you might be interested in and where this application will end up being useful. Okay, so suppose just thinking of it classically, even if you have a conformally compact manifold, why not, right? So this could be, um, you know, a space time um, and you've conformally compactified it or just some other geometry. It's a general question. Um, <clears throat> so suppose that this thing is um, not just conformally compact, but say asymptotically de Sitter or asymptotically hyperbolic or Poincaré-Einstein, you know, whatever these things mean, I've explained a little bit about some of those things, but I'll, I'll explain more as we go. Um, but given some restriction like that on the interior geometry, but how it behaves asymptotically, what can you then say about, for instance, the intrinsic geometry of the boundary? Is it restricted? You know, even locally, is it restricted? The extrinsic geometry, so the embedding of this boundary, thinking of it as a hypersurface in this ambient manifold, how is that restricted? Um, the conformal geometry of this manifold near the boundary, can you have any conformal manifold going out to infinity or is it restricted? Um, and then lastly, um, but very importantly, of course, is the asymptotics. 
actually of the metric here. So not just the, its conformal structure, but the scale as you go out to the boundary. Okay, so those are sorts of questions um, that you might want to treat. And, you know, if you had a good calculus, you should be able to answer. And what I want to explain is that um, this sort of calculus of scale thing fits perfectly into treating these sort of problems. Some of these answers to some of these things were known previously. I'm just moving that over there. Good. Okay, so the boundary... I want to think of it as a hypersurface. So remember that for us in our conformal compactifications, it always will be, or nearly always. Um, so that means an embedded co-dimension one submanifold, um, but, but I'm including when that can be a boundary as in these pictures. Now, just mathematically, one of the reasons that hypersurfaces are so important in geometry is exactly because they're boundaries, um, typically. So if you have a domain in, in space, you know, in complex space or something like that, then its boundary is a hypersurface. Um, if you have a manifold with boundary, then its boundary is obviously a hypersurface, right? So, um, <clears throat> so for those reasons, and when you want to study things like PDE on the, uh, in, in these settings and so on, you need to understand about hypersurface geometry so so it's important and that's exactly the reason we want to here okay so to be precise here hypersurface and i'm going to often call it sigma or it might be the boundary of m um, so it means a smoothly embedded co-dimension one submanifold um, of a conformal manifold so we're working in the setting of conformal manifolds which we defined yesterday um, and again the conformal manifold will usually have dimension d so the hypersurface We'll have dimension D minus one, which we sometimes call N. Okay, and we're going to restrict to those hypersurfaces that have the property that the co-normal field along it is nowhere null, right? So, um, so these are what you might call non-degenerate hypersurfaces. It's not that we can't handle any aspects of the other case, but this, it, you know, this is the simpler setting and already extremely interesting. Now, when you have that, um, so when the co-normal is nowhere null, then the restriction of any metric from the conformal class gives you a metric on the hypersurface, a first fundamental form, if you like, um, and therefore it's conformal class. Um, and so the conformal, the ambient conformal class is inducing a conformal class of metrics on the hypersurface, um, which I'll often call C bar. Okay, so in this context of working with hypersurfaces in conformal manifolds, it's natural to um, use conormals with a weight because we use we have the conformal metric canonically and its inverse has weight minus two. So you would like the conormal to have weight one so that so that this can be a number, so it can be unit, you know, so so it can be a unit conormal. Um, so we would take this to be, have weight one. Okay, so that's the sort of natural setting. That's nothing new. That's well known that you should do that. Okay, so let's recall, first of all, some Riemannian objects. So, um, so very basic um, hypersurface invariants from Riemannian geometry. Well, I already mentioned the first fundamental form, which is just a restriction of an ambient um, metric to the to the hypersurface which is then giving you an induced metric that's sometimes called the first fundamental form um, or just the induced metric the second fundamental form um, is described in various ways but um, one of my one favorites of my favorite is just to say it's the restriction of the derivative of the co-normal um, and we're, we're just in Romanian geometry here initially so that's not necessarily weighted to um, the tensor product of the tangent space to the submanifold with itself, right? To, to T sigma cross T sigma. <clears throat> okay, now we, we, we're always going to think of the tangent space to the hypersurface as being a subspace um, of the ambient, the ambient tangent space along the hypersurface. So, so we'll always think of T sigma sitting inside TM um, as, as the, you know, annihilator of the conormal. Okay, so well, if you take the derivative um, of the co-normal, now you might say, well, you know, you, to define that really, you should extend this co-normal off. So you take any 
any extension of this off smoothly so that you can define the derivative. But once you restrict it to um, T sigma in this way, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't depend on your choice of extension. Okay, well, that defines the second fundamental form. Um, here, the, this is the levy sevita connection for your metric you're working with. Um, and here's a way of, of defining it. Um, so it's, you know, you're thinking of the second fundamental form now as something that can um, take in vectors from TM. So this is automatically um, has the property that it, it sort of projects off the, the normal part and ends up giving you something that's, you know, really a tensor on T sigma. Okay, so a formula like that. Okay, and the minus or plus just corresponds to whether the, the um, co-normal has length plus or minus one. So because we are in pseudo-Romanian setting, um, the, the co-normal might be um, sort of space-like or time-like. And so if we're in Lorentzian signature, you know, that would make good, be good terminology. Okay, well, the second fundamental form itself is not conformally invariant. So um, what, what does it do under a conformal rescaling? So what does that mean? Well, remember from yesterday that we replaced the metric with a positive function times the metric. And um, today it looks like I'm writing that positive function as the exponential of um, just an arbitrary function, two, two times omega. So the two is sort of convention. I won't go into the details of why that, but um, so omega here is just any smooth function. And then two times that is another smooth function. You take its exponential, that gives you a positive function. Okay, so that's how we're going to rescale. That's our convention. And then the second fundamental form tra transforms like this. Now, what you notice straight away is it's transforming only by its trace part, you know, so that so the trace free part of this. So here, this epsilon as as in yesterday's talk is, is D of omega. I used a different way of rescaling, but it's the same epsilon. Um, so it's the exterior derivative of that function. Um, so then the the, according to this, the trace free part of the second fundamental form must be conformally invariant. And that's, of course, extremely well known. I don't know from when, but a long, long, long time ago. Um, so I'm putting a little zero above that to mean the trace free part. So that's, you get that by subtracting the mean curvature times, um, and here I'm taking everything weighted. So this mean curvature um, will have weight minus one. So now I'm sort of using the conformal convention. So L itself will now be coming from a, a derivative of the weight one co-normal. So L will have weight one. This G has weight two. So H will have weight minus one. So that's how it works. That's the mean curvature. Um, and you can take that by taking the, the restricted metric or the first fundamental form um, inverse, but I'm actually taking the conformal version and contracting it into the second fundamental form and dividing by the dimension of this, the hypersurface, right, to D minus one. So those are the conventions. So that thing is conformally invariant. And of course, from that, you can also deduce um, how the mean curvature transforms. So let's remember that. Uh, here it is, I seem to jump, jump a slide then. Okay, so, from that same formula, you can deduce that the mean curvature, when you do this conformal, conformal transformation, transforms like this. It picks up a little bit of um, the epsilon contracted into the co-normal, or I've written it the other way around. I've raised the index using the conformal metric and contracted the, um, you know, what would then be the normal vector, weighted normal vector into the uh, epsilon of the conformal transformation. So that's how the mean curvature transforms. Um, and then an interesting observation that goes back to um, our, you know, my article with Toby Bailey and Mike Eastwood from a long, long time ago, um, is that this enables us to build along long the hypersurface a tractor that, you know, this thing transforms correctly. And this is what we call the normal tractor. So it just, remember the tractors have three slots. This has zero in the top slot. You put that weighted co-normal in the middle. <clears throat> and then in the, in the bottom slot, which is, was again a line bundle, um, is going to be minus this weighted mean curvature. Now, tractors have a certain way of transforming conformally, which is the hallmark of them being secretly invariant. You know, the conformal transformation is just coming from the way you split things. 
Um, and because of the conformal transformation of H here, this thing exactly transformed correctly to be a tractor. So this is a conformally invariant object, and it's what we call the normal tractor. And remember, the co-normal has length uh, plus or minus one, depending on whether it's space-like, respectively, time-like. And so when you feed this thing into the tractor metric, you also get plus or minus one. So this is a tractor analog of the co-normal for conformal geometry, provided the, the um, you know, provided it's a non null setting. Okay, now um, here's a, a, a first important result, um, which produces something that we call a conformal shape operator. So just as we differentiated the normal to get the second fundamental form, remember above, perhaps I can flick back to that. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Right, so here it was. So remember the second fundamental form is the derivative of the co-normal, but then restricted um, to, to the tangent bundle to the hypersurface. So just as we do that, um, we, we can do the analogous thing of differentiating this tractor normal along the hypersurface. And so here, this nabla with a line underneath it just means the usual tractor connection but the line underneath means we're going to restrict to directions tangent to, to sigma, to, this, to the hypersurface. Okay, well, if you just do this and use that formula for the tractor connection that I gave you yesterday, um, then it's easy to see that you get zero in the top slot. You get exactly the trace-free second fundamental form in the middle slot, and you get its divergence in the bottom slot. Now, this, of course, the normal track is conformally invariant. This is a conformally invariant operator. So this thing must be conformally invariant. Well, zero certainly is. Because it's zero there, nothing feeds into this slot. And it's correct that there should be something conformally invariant in that slot. And there is the trace free second fundamental form. And then this divergence makes this transform correctly exactly as a tractor. So, <clears throat> but now what you see is that this derivative of the normal is just a sort of prolongation of the second trace free second fundamental form. So um, you get the result that the normal, the tractor normal, the normal tractor is parallel along um, the hypersurface exactly if and only if the trace free second fundamental form vanishes. That's just clear from this formula. And that's what's called totally umbilic. So when you have a hypersurface whose trace free second fundamental form vanishes, then it's called totally umbilic. It, it's sort of maximally sphere-like if that happens at each point. Okay, so that's one object that you can obviously form that, that's to do with sort of calculus of hypersurfaces. Um, so looking again to Riemannian geometry, another thing that's very important is called the, the Gauss formula. So here's the Gauss formula using the ordinary second fundamental form. So now we're just in Romanian geometry again. So if you take the ambient levy sevita connection and act on a vector field tangent to your hypersurface, um, then it relates that derivative of um, to the intrinsic levy sevita connection. So remember, if you have a hypersurface and a Romanian manifold in it, and it's non non-degenerate, it doesn't have a, a null co-normal, then um, it will get induced on it a metric. And so it has its own intrinsic levy sevita connection. And you can compare those two connections acting on this vector field that's tangent to the hypersurface. And the difference comes out to be linked to the second fundamental form again. Okay, so that's the Gauss formula. So it's, it's the failure, um, if you like, of when you take this ambient connection and differentiate the, the tangent vector to the hypersurface along the hypersurface, it's the failure of it, it's measuring the failure of it to stay in the, in the hypersurface, at least this term is. Okay, well, that's the sort of basis for pseudo Riemannian hypersurface calculus. This is one of the most important formulae. Most other things follow from it. So we want a conformal analog of that, and that will turn out to be important. Now, First, you see a problem straight away when you try and extend it, because here we're using the fact 
that the tangent bundle to the hypersurface sits naturally inside the tangent bundle to the manifold along the hypersurface. That should be, by the way, TM restricted to sigma, sorry. Um, so we need an analog of that. Well, um, okay, so what do I mean? So we have a, a, a submanifold sigma, a hypersurface sitting inside a conformal manifold, and it gets induced on a conformal structure. That's easy, right? So we mentioned that above. So it has its own tractor connection and, and so on. And it has and, and its own tractor bundle. <clears throat> but we have an ambient tractor bundle. And to get a formula similar to this Gauss formula, you would need to know how those two tractor bundles are related. You want an analog of this, this thing we used here that the, that the um, tangent bundle to the hypersurface sits inside the ambient tangent bundle. Well, actually, that works out nicely, um, and that was observed quite a long time ago um, by myself with Tom Branson. Um, and then um, I had this um, grant was a student of mine who wrote this up sort of in a, in a master's thesis, which is the, one of the places it was written down um, fairly carefully. I could explain that. But anyway, there's a, a conformally invariant um, isomorphism between... Um, the the well the intrinsic tractor bundle so you take so you have your submanifold with its own conformal structure this hypersurface it has its own tangent bundle then uh tractor bundle sorry um so i'm assuming here let's say that the dimension of the ambient space is at least four to keep life simple so that this sigma has dimension three so um it certainly has its usual tractor bundle and connection um you can identify that with the orthogonal complement inside the ambient tractor bundle um, to the normal tractor. Okay, so the sort of most obvious thing works. So you have your ambient tractor bundle along the hypersurface, you take n perp inside there, then that can be identified with the intrinsic tractor bundle. Now, the easy way to see that is simply to, to compute in a scale. And this exactly is the mapping that takes the triples that give you tractors in M perp, in the, the perp to the normal tractor, and maps them to triples in the intrinsic tractor bundle. Now, just to make sense of this, by the way, in here in the middle slot, I'm identifying um, the, the cotangent bundle, if you like, to, to sigma as a sub-bundle of the ambient cotangent bundle that is the um, sub-bundles of annihilators to, 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 the, to the normal um, vector, if you like, the normal vector field or the weighted normal vector field. So the usual thing. Okay, and you can see that the mean curvature is featuring a lot here. And um, in fact, if you, you can always work along the hypersurface in a scale where the mean curvature is zero. You can arrange that. You can, you can pick a metric from the conformal class that has that property. And then the triples match up in the obvious way. And that was the, the statement that Tom Branson and I made. And, and um, it was in Grant's thesis that we put this down. It was actually a calculation I did, but it wasn't the main point of his thesis. Okay, so so now we we have the analog of this, you know, the analog of um, the tangent bundle to the hypersurface sitting inside there. We have that the intrinsic tractor bundle, how it sits inside the ambient tractor bundle along the hypersurface, means that we can consider making a Gauss formula. So how does that work? So that's going to give us something that we'll call the tractor Gauss equation. Um, so what you see now is that we now have two connections on, on the intrinsic tractor bundle because we've now identified it with n perp. So the two connections are we have the intrinsic tractor connection, which of course can act on that, um, and then also the projected ambient tractor connection. So this is a standard construction. What you do is you take something in n perp, so that's something in the intrinsic tractor bundle, if you like, along the hypersurface. <clears throat> you differentiate with the ambient tractor connection, but in directions along the hypersurface, that's what that pi means. And then you project back to the um, in perp using the obvious projector that you make out of the normal tractor, you know, so the Kronecker delta minus nn type thing. 
Okay, so that gives you the projected ambient tractor connection. So that's the sort of standard construction that probably you've seen in other settings um, for other connections. Um, so, so those are the orthogonal projections. Um, and so you have that acting on the intrinsic tractor bundle when you have the intrinsic tractor connection. And the difference between those two is what are the first two terms well, are explained by the first two terms on the right-hand side. So you see this, this projected tractor connection I'm calling nabla tilde. Well, the first two terms on the right-hand side, that are, they are giving nabla tilde. Okay, so the difference between the intrinsic tractor connection and the projected ambient one is this thing called S, um, which I'm giving a formula for here. And then the other term, which is more like the formula in the Gauss formula um, from Romanian geometry, is involving this tractor second fundamental form or the tractor shape operator. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that one is measuring the failure of, this term here is measuring the failure of, of um, an intrinsic type tractor to stay intrinsic when you differentiate it with the ambient tractor connection. Okay, so you get these two terms. We already explained L that comes from the trace-free second fundamental form, a sort of prolongation. What is S? <clears throat> well, S is really just um, a thing called the Fialkov tensor. So there's an invariant tractor injector that is putting the Fialkov tensor into a tractor in a sort of obvious way. I won't go into all the details of that. <clears throat> but so the so the so that a meaty content of this S is given by this formula here. Um, which by construction better be something conformally invariant. And it sort of obviously is because it's made out of the vial curvature, which is the conformally invariant trace-free part of the Riemann tensor um, and the trace-free second fundamental form um, sort of squared with, you know, multiplied with itself, composed with itself and uh, traced. Uh, no, not traced there, just composed with itself to give a two tensor um, and then composed and traced to give that term. Okay, so... Um, so this thing was already known in the literature due to Fialkov, um, and it can also be expressed as, as sort of mainly a difference between the two Scutton tensors, the ambient one and the intrinsic one, and it looks more mysterious then. Okay, so we have that basic tool. <laughs> okay, so now we want to apply that to um, understand the geometry of conformal infinity, and I can see I'm going to have to go a little bit more quickly. Um, so, so now we're going to go to conformally compact geometries again, which we're understanding in terms of the scale tractor on a conformal structure. And recall the scale tractor is given by this uh, one over D Thomas D operator on, on the scale sigma. Um, and we want to consider, we'll specialize to the case that our um, conformally compact manifold MCI is asymptotically of constant non-zero scale curvature. <laughs> so in other words, the scalar curvature, scalar curvature as, you, you know, as you go to infinity is becoming constant at some rate. And in fact, mainly we'll just make it at the last minute, it's becoming constant. So um, what we will assume um, and what that will mean, that will mean is that by, and by imposing a constant dilation, we can in fact assume that I squared, the length squared of the scale tractor becomes either plus or minus one as we hit the boundary at infinity. And then and up to up some to order, some order you know, that we'll talk about. about. Now, when that happens, if I squared is plus or minus one, it turns out that it's either, um, if it's plus one, it's either asymptotically hyperbolic, if you're saying Romanian signature, or if in Lorentzian signature, it would be um, anti de Sitter. Um, <clears throat> so asymptotically anti de Sitter. Um, or if it's minus one, then it's an asymptotically de Sitter, right? You'd have to be in at least the Rensian signature. Okay, then <clears throat> the claim is the scale tractor is going to strongly link the geometry of the boundary to the interior. And the first step in this is this quite surprising, very simple, but surprising result. So suppose you have this almost pseudo Romanian structure, so conformal manifold with a scale tractor. Um, and remember, in the scale, scale tractor is nowhere vanishing. And suppose the scale singularity set is, is non-empty. I mean, that just means, really just means where sigma is zero. Okay, and then um, suppose that you have I squared equals plus or minus the uh, one plus sigma squared times F. 
So of course, away from sigma equals zero, this is not restrictive at all, but what it means is that as you approach sigma equals zero, this thing is approaching plus or minus one at that rate. So remember, sigma is a defining density for the boundary. So think of it like a coordinate near the, that with the zero locus the boundary. <clears throat> okay, well, if that happens, then sigma is a smoothly embedded hypersurface. We already talked about that yesterday. And here's the, the new punchline. Um, <clears throat> then with, with n being the normal tractor, we have that this agrees with the scales tractor restricted to sigma. So remarkably, with these assumptions, the, the scale tractor, when you get to the boundary at infinity, just becomes the normal tractor along its the zero locus of sigma. Little sigma. Okay, so the proof of that, well, I'm not going to do it in full detail. Um, instead of assuming the asymptotic case, but just for simplicity, let's just assume I squared equals plus or minus one. Um, <clears throat> and then sigma is the top slot of I, that's what I'm writing here. Then along the zero locus of little sigma, this I, which was given by the formula yesterday, has obviously zero in the top slot. That's where sigma was. It's derivative. And then this Laplacian term. Well, if I is becoming, has length plus or minus one at the boundary, then, then this formula and the tractometric formula means that the co-normal, sorry, the derivative of sigma, which gives you a co-normal for its zero locus, um, is going to have length plus or minus one. So it gives you a unit co-normal in our conformal sense. And then a little computation shows that actually this bottom term is exactly minus the mean curvature. So that's it, you got the normal tractor out. So it's quite simple, but, but surprising. <clears throat> okay, now a corollary um, is that if you have a structure that's asymptotically Einstein, then it has to be totally umbilic. So how do you see that? Well, remember that if it's asymptotically Einstein, then the scale tractor would be parallel asymptotically. So if, it, if say, it's asymptotically Einstein it, it, with, with the I squared being plus or minus one, right, which means that the scalar curvature is um, negative, becoming, you know, negative constant or positive constant by that certain factor. Um, so, so um, and, and suppose that, we're not asking that this thing be parallel everywhere, but just suppose that at the boundary, um, it becomes zero at this rate. You know, so the derivative of the scale tractor is sigma times a smooth function or a smooth appropriate object. Okay, so that would vanish along the boundary, so it would be parallel on the boundary. <clears throat> then the boundary has to be totally umbilic. So how do you see that? Well, these two conditions are sufficient to go back and imply um, the conditions of this corollary where we, um, sorry, of this thing up here, where we got the scale tractor became the normal tractor, the previous result. <clears throat> okay, so, whoops, goodness, when I could hear it. Goes in the wrong direction for some reason. Um, Okay, so when we have this, we, we get that the length squared of i is plus or minus plus sigma squared times a smooth function. Therefore, the scale tractor agrees with the normal tractor. And then this condition tells us that the normal tractor is parallel along the hypersurface. So it has to be totally umbilic by our earlier result for the normal tractor. Okay, so asymptotically Einstein implies totally umbilic. Um, that was an easy result. So that's telling us something about the extrinsic geometry of the boundary. <coughs> okay, um, now if we assume just slightly stronger result, so if we assume that um, I squared along sigma is plus or minus one, and the derivative of the um, scale tractor vanishes to second order along the boundary, <coughs> then along the boundary, Obviously, the scale tractor is parallel, um, and and also its derivative. You know, it sort of works to to another derivative because it's second order. So you can compute the curvature, and because it's parallel to that order, the scale tractor has to annihilate the tractor curvature. So this is the tractor curvature here, um, which means that the normal tractor has to 
annihilate the tractor curvature because the scale tractor and the normal tractor agree. That was what we just talked about at, when you have it at the sorter. Um, and then you just compute what that means. And that will tell you that the normal contracted into the vowel curvature has to vanish along the boundary. Okay, well, we already know the thing is totally umbilic. So the trace free second fundamental form vanishes. If the normal into the vial vanishes, then the Fialkov vanishes. But by our earlier result, um, remember the difference between the ambient tractor connection and the intrinsic tractor connection were by this thing S, which involved the Fialkov, and by the um, by the shape tractor, which involved the trace free second fundamental form. So if they both vanish, then those things distinguishing those connections go away, and the ambient tractor connection agrees with the intrinsic tractor connection of the boundary. And that's what this theorem states. Okay, so if you have this order of asymptotics, so that I squared is plus or minus one um, at the boundary, and the derivative of the scale tractor vanishes to second order, then the tractor connection, the ambient tractor connection preserves the intrinsic one of the boundary, um, or the zero locus, if you're thinking of it just as a you know, inside a manifold. Um, <clears throat> and what's more, the ambient parallel uh, transport agrees with the intrinsic parallel transport. So we see that asymptotically, Einstein is forcing very strong agreement of these things. Okay, well, let's just, um, as I said, I'm running well behind time. Um, <laughs> so a little summary to this point. Um, so we had those questions that we thought we might ask. So one of them was the asymptotics of the metric near the boundary. So this was actually question four before. But one of the things that's easy to show is that if I squared is plus or minus one at the boundary, um, then the space has to be, if you're in Lorentzian signature, um, it would be asymptotically to sitter if that was, say, minus one. Um, or if in Romanian signature and it was a plus one, it would be asymptotically hyperbolic, for instance. Um, and it'd be, if you're in Lorentzian and it was a plus one, it'd be anti to sitter and so on. And this, the, the Riemann curvature has to behave like this. The leading term um, is just um, of a space form type um, behavior. <clears throat> so that's why you get this result. And this, this you just get easily by looking at the conformal transformation of the Riemann curvature. Now we just explained that if it's asymptotically Einstein to sufficient order that Fialkov vanishes and its trace fee second fundamental form vanishes. And actually, <clears throat> you can continue that story. In a recent article um, with Sam Blitz and Andrew Waldron discusses higher fundamental forms that also vanish them. The conformal geometry of the ambient manifold is restricted. We just observed that if it's asymptotically Einstein, the normal into the vial curvature has to be zero at the boundary, okay? For instance, in dimension four Romanian signature, that would mean that the vial curvature has to vanish at the boundary. So you, you do get strong restrictions. And then there's a sort of old and famous result, you know, the intrinsic geometry, this Pfeffman graham if, you, if, you're, if you're asymptotically Einstein to sort of high enough order, then the Pfeffman graham abstraction tensor of the intrinsic um, manifold, uh, intrinsic boundary, if it's even dimensional, would have to vanish. So there are lots of results. And this one wasn't proved using the scale tractor um, historically, but you can do it that way. So I did that with Peterson at some stage. Okay, <clears throat> let's jump to scattering because I'm really getting late on time, uh, low on time. <clears throat> okay, suppose now that you have one of these conformally compact manifolds and on the interior, you want to solve um, an equation like this. So this is a sort of problem that's looked a lot at in, in scattering, both in, in GR when that's the wave operator and in Romanian geometry when that's a Laplacian. And so you're looking at, um, well, almost eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Okay, so we want to do this. But if we do this in a conformally compact manifold, <coughs> the boundaries at infinity. So what are the right Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions? How do you find them? Well, of course, there's a big history of this. People like Melrose and his whole school studying this sort of thing. Um, and they study exactly this equation very often. And then in that context, S is called the spectral parameter. 
So that same equation gets written down, um, you know, sort of not just in the context of conformal geometry, but much more generally. Now let's jump back to my idea of coupling. Remember at the end of last lecture, I said we would do this. So we have the scale tractor. We're on an almost uh, pseudo Riemannian manifold. So we have the scale tractor. Um, <clears throat> you can couple that to the Thomas D. Remember also I said there was the second order Thomas D operator. I'm circling it down here. Um, so you can couple it in the obvious way. It's just a sort of standard Lego move that you contract those two indices together. So this will act on any weighted tractor bundle by its construction. It'll be sort of invariant once you've picked the scale tractor. Um, so it'll be conformally invariant once you've fixed your scale tractor. Um, and it'll lower weight by one. So what's it look like? Well, if you just write it out in general, it looks like a big mess. So here it is expanded out. It's got a Laplacian. It's got some first order terms and some zero order terms here and here. Um, so it just it actually looks pretty ugly and looks like it won't be useful. But actually, if you write it with a metric, you know, where you actually have a metric, so where sigma doesn't vanish, and you use those um, sigma to trivialize densities, then this thing exactly picks up that operator we were just talking about that, that, you, that people study in the scattering. Okay, so I dot D just picks up that thing. I sometimes call it scattering Laplacian, but you know, it's it, as I say, it can be a wave operator if you're in Lorentzian signature. <clears throat> and in particular, people look at it in the case, especially when um, the thing has constant scalar curvature, and you can see then that this actually becomes this formula, which you'll see in all sorts of scattering papers. So this is like the most common thing that people are studying in scattering almost. Okay. Um, so solutions of this are going to be some sort of eigenvectors of the Laplacian. You know, you have to say what you mean by boundary conditions when you say that. Um, and it's used in scattering theories. So that's what happens on the interior away from the boundary. What happens to this operator I dot D that's giving that thing? Um, what happens on the boundary? Well, where sigma zero this thing actually degenerates to a first order operator. Because remember, there was actually a sigma in front of the Laplacian. So where sigma is zero, you can't just say I'm trivializing densities using sigma. And this thing degenerates to a first order operator, but it gives you another famous thing, namely the conformal Raban operator. So this is a conformally invariant boundary operator. So overall, I dot D is a sort of degenerate Laplacian. Now, <clears throat> it then turns out to satisfy a remarkable algebra. So um, if you have a conformal structure of dimension D at least three, that's all we need for the current stuff, um, then a direct computation shows that this I dot D operator, which remember was a big mess when you write it out in general, it's commutator bracket with sigma, that the scale, you know, this generalized scale, is just the length squared of a scale tractor times this sort of weight operator, which is the dimension plus two times the, the usual weight operator. So if you just make the assumption that I squared doesn't vanish, so this is asking that the generalized scalar curvature doesn't vanish, then this actually gives you an SL2. So you make sigma X, you make I dot D, or at least this multiple of it Y, and then you get the usual SL2 generators that people, you know, that you usually write down. <clears throat> so remarkably, this really horrible operator, you know, initially looked, what looked like a horrible operator, um, gives you a very beautiful Lie algebra with, with sigma SL2. Now that's important because we can use it to apply it to boundary problems. So, um, <clears throat> so, First of all, you can construct, you can recover sort of GJMS type operators. So let's observe that. So take operators which are basically powers of I dot D. Okay, well, modified by this one over minus one over I squared. So remember here, I squared is not necessarily constant. So it, this minus one over I squared I dot D is really a very complicated object if you expand it all out. But nevertheless, that's the thing that was part of the SL2. So take its kth power. Um, and then apply that at a suitable weight. And on the boundary, it gives you um, a tangential operator. <laughs> so, so if you take that power of I dot D, um, apply it to tractors of a suitable weight, and then do this along the boundary, 
then it will actually give you an operator that takes these boundary tractors to boundary tractors. Okay, so this is what it's saying here. So it takes these, these tractors restricted to the boundary to tractors restricted to the boundary because it actually is tangential. So when you take this weight and that power of that thing, it, it, it differentiates, it turns out to be what's called a tangential operator. So in a sense, it just differentiates in directions along the hypersurface. Now, the proof of that, this uses the, the same idea from the GJMS paper that it uses the SL2. Um, this operator PK is YK in the language of the SL2, um, and you have standard SL2 identity. So you just look at this thing operating on a, on a function F, which you think of as being along the boundary, but extended off a little bit. And you try adding um, sigma times another function where the only rule is that, you know, you end up with something with a well-defined weight, which is K minus N over two still. Um, and then this SL2 relation means that this YK just commutes with the X so that it didn't depend actually, once you restrict back to the hypersurface on how you extended it off by this H. So you conclude that the PK is tangential. And then expanding these I dot Ds tells you that when you expand this out, you actually get a Laplacian power operator. Um, so these are generally what we now call extrinsically coupled GJMS operators, but um, they actually give you the usual GJMS operators if your ambient manifold was Poincaré Einstein to high enough order. <clears throat> okay, so let's go back now to talking about boundary problems. Um, so that was one sort of application of that I.D, but let's go back to the boundary problem. There's this operator that, well, this differential equation that they use in scattering theory, which I've written here. Um, so, you know, how, how can we study that? Now, first of all, you want to study good, you know, set up good boundary conditions. And, and for that, you might want to consider studying this thing formally. So we will do that. So we want to study this equation formally, and we're going to use again that we have this SL2. Okay, so here's a sort of formal problem. Given um, a density on the boundary and an arbitrary extension of this um, into the interior um, so that it still has weight W naught, right? So in other words, this could be a tractor or a um, just a density, that's what the fire means, it could be a tractor, and then you're extending it off so it has a well-defined weight. Try, ex try a sort of formal expansion so that you can solve this I dot D problem to some order, right? And you want that to be as high as possible. That's what it means to solve the problem formally. Okay, well, because um, we have this SL2, we can recast it that way. We have these SL2 identities again, you can just solve this inductively. So um, you suppose that you've solved it up to, you know, I'm circling down here, you suppose that you've solved it up to order X to the L, so Y F L equals order X to the L, and you want to get L plus one, you just use the SL2 to see that you can you can do that. So the 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 Y hits the next power of sigma, and this it'll be up here, it'll hit this power of sigma times F L plus one. And it gives you this number. So provided this number is not zero, you can solve the problem um, and, and make it to the next order. So I guess that should be, uh, that should have been an OL plus two there. My apologies. <clears throat> okay, so, um, oh no, 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 so it's, it's correct. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, well, so then it's obvious provided L is not equal to H naught minus two, you can solve this. H naught is just, um, you know, what happens when this weight operator H hits this F. So it's sort of D plus two W naught or W naught is the weight of it and so on. Um, so this is just an obvious way of solving it using the SL2. So it's first of all remarkable that mainly you can. And of course, you're going to hit an abstraction um, when you have that, um, when you hit that weight um, where you can no longer solve it. And then once again, by a sort of well-known procedure, that, that gives you the abstraction to solving it further, but, but it actually recovers these um, extrinsic Laplacian operators I was talking about before. So, um, so provided W naught is never K minus N over two, you can just solve that problem to all orders 
and you can even give formulae for the asymptotic solutions to all orders. Um, but then if you hit this weight, then it's, it's subtracted and the abstraction, so I'm not going to go through this in detail because of the time, um, is exactly this tangential operator I was talking about before. Um, and as I say, if it's almost Einstein to high enough order, these are exactly the TJMS operators. So there's some dimension parity sort of changing how that looks. Okay, well, I'm going way too fast and I'm not going to be able to do the second part of my talk, I think. <laughs> okay, um, what about solutions? So that was one type of solution where we started off, um, so just to go back, we started off with it, just obvious sort of Dirichlet data, F0 plus sigma times that and some extended formulae. So another thing you can do is take a power of sigma times F and have an expansion like that. So this is something else that's looked at in scattering solutions like this. So if you apply the SL2 to this, you see that when you hit this with Y, this alpha, when it hits the sigma to the alpha, that will have nothing to cancel against. So you'll get no solution um, <clears throat> except for two cases, right? So, well, th this is the problem. How do we solve it for that? But using this SL2 down here, this relation now this time, so Y on X, the alpha, and by the way, <clears throat> This alpha doesn't have to be an integer power. So this just works for any power of alpha, any real power, or even complex, but I won't go into that. Um, so you immediately see that this I dot, that there'll be no solution because of this sigma of the alpha term, unless um, one of two things happen, either alpha zero, which is the case we did before, or it's um, alpha's H naught minus one. Okay, so, um, so, so there's two possible solutions where H naught um, is defined in terms of the um, in terms of the weight, the W naught. I won't go into all that, but there's another specific weight that'll work. Um, and so you get exactly two solutions at a given. So you had a given weight W naught. You're trying to make things work. You get the first Dirichlet type solution, and then you get a second type of solution that's coming from um, alpha being this other power where it's H naught minus one which is H naught, as I say, it's G plus two W naught. Okay, so we get these two types of solutions that you can get, or if you trivialize the density bundles using instead the scale of the interior, right, then the solution then looks like this, which is exactly what you see in all the scattering theory. So, and they, they get these answers by using an additional equation and so on and microlocal analysis. But you can see here that this just comes out for free um, basically using this I dot D approach. So that's basically um, all I'm going to say about the scattering. Um, the, the remarkable thing you're observing here is that we started off, if you had think of a conformally compact manifold classically, understanding how to treat the boundary in these scattering problems is quite complicated. But at least you see that if you use the scale tractor, then a lot of these things are just in a sense become... Um, well, I would say massively simpler. <laughs> so, so, so many of these things we've recovered, uh, um, you know, results of whole papers and various things. So, so, but they come out very simply. So, it's it's a nice sort of one package for doing all that. And I would say that for those of you looking at problems, there's lots of scope to to use this for other sorts of problems. So, linked to scattering and so on. Um, you you know, other equations other than the wave operator. Okay. Well, um, part two. I think, um, I guess I started a little bit late, so I'll say just a couple of words about it, but I'll probably have to mainly talk about that at the start of the next talk. Um, but let, let's at least talk about the motiva motivation for a minute. Um, and one is that if you look at stereographic projection that we talked about before, um, it's an absolutely amazing way to projectify Euclidean, uh, so to compactify Euclidean space because it's conformal, so you know it's angle preserving. But actually, it's a very bad compactification for some applications. For instance, for representation theory of the Euclidean group, it's not very useful because the Euclidean group acts on Euclidean space, of course, and this mapping gives you an action of it on the sphere, which then extends to the compactification, but, but the Euclidean group just acts trivially on the compactification because it's one point, right? So, so the Euclidean group gives you no information on that point. So this, and then in scattering, it's similar. In scattering, 
you would like a proper boundary because you want to take data on the boundary and extend it off and then you know solving some problem and then take the sort of Neumann data of it. Um, but if you've got no boundary, you can't really do that. So this is a bad compactification for some things. And this is a sort of um, a sort of um, 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 motivation to start looking at other ideas, perhaps. Okay, so so you know what I'm going to talk about on this thing, and I'm just jumping ahead, is that it, when we when we revisit conformal compactification, so here's the um, sort of standard picture of the compactification of hyperbolic space. Here's Escher's version of it with fish. Um, or otherwise, <clears throat> um, here's the Poincaré ball model. So this um, here, dx squared, this summed up, this is the usual dot product. And then if you conformally transform it in this way, so this is four over one minus, so this is x dotted with itself, x is just your position. So this is gonna become singular at the, at the unit ball, right? So this metric is blowing up, making the boundary of the unit ball be at infinity. And in fact, this is the hyperbolic metric on the interior. So it's really the space form metric. So this hyperbolic ball, just by dint of being embedded in Euclidean space, is giving you a compactification of hyperbolic space. But what's really going on in that compactification? So, um, so what I'll talk about um, tomorrow and then going into projective compactification is um, how we understand, you know, how, you, how looking at this again, we've looked at it in one way already. Um, so this is a sort of model for conformal compactification. But if we look at this again, we'll see that we can understand this in terms of Lie groups, and that will tell us a way to make curved versions rather more generally, um, including projective compactification, which is what I'll talk about. Okay, so I will stop there <laughs> because I've run out of time, and I'm sorry I misjudged it. Um, so thank you very much. I just wanted to, yeah, please. So if uh, there's any questions, uh, here uh, in the audience, please grab a microphone, or if there's anyone from me? the uh, Zoom who can. Let me ask, you ask a question. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so, Rob, this uh, this SL two uh, that pops up, it seems pretty fun fundamental to the, the latter part of your talk today. Um, yeah. I'm just wondering if the if there are similar SL twos popping up in in like in CR or in projective or and like is there a broader con conceptual picture like predicting the existence of such uh, nice SL2s to work with? Um, okay, so I, I don't know about a broad thing predicting them, but um, I think that, that, that there could be perhaps coming from the group theory. Um, I, have, I have thought about thinking about that, but I haven't really done it. But certainly in projective geometry, it does work. So I will mention that perhaps at the end of next one. Um, and I have a student here who's written it out and also a student um, who visited here, um, and we discussed it a bit here, and he's written it in his thesis is Jack Borthwick um, at the University of Brest has also sort of identified that. So in projective geometry, you get a similar SLT2 turning up. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in suitable CR situations, I'm pretty sure that you'll get one as well. So, um, so I do think it's a, a fairly universal Phenomena and and even that the, that 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 there will be more complicated algebras sitting around. I imagine, right? So, thanks. Um, gradedly algebras and so on. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Right. If not, let's thank Rod again.